In a previous episode, we talked about multiplying things that aren't numbers. But what happens if you divide things that aren't numbers? We all know you can't divide by the number zero, but in some sense, the notion of dividing by zero appears every time you use modular arithmetic. The structures that underlie this modding business are called equivalence relations and quotient sets, and that's what I'd like to dive into today. In Gabe's episode on the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, he referred you to Kelsey's video, How to Break Cryptography. There, she introduced modular arithmetic, which, as she described, is what happens when you count in a circle. Let's focus on mod 5 arithmetic, where 3 plus 4 equals 2, for example. What's really going on here? If you were to look for an explanation in a textbook or online, you'd come across equivalence classes and quotient sets. But what are those? Let's try to understand equivalence classes first. To start, we'll look at the set of integers. Now, any integer either is a multiple of 5 or it is not. Pretty simple. But an integer can fail to be a multiple of 5 in several ways, 4 to be exact. An integer can be off by 1, that is, its remainder upon division by 5 is 1. For example, 11 is not a multiple of 5 because 11 is 10 plus 1. Or an integer can be off by 2, that is, its remainder upon division by 5 is 2. For example, negative 8 is not a multiple of 5 because negative 8 is negative 10 plus 2. Similarly, an integer can be off by 3 or an integer can be off by 4. So this lets us organize or partition the integers according to their divisibility or lack thereof by 5. Let's put those integers that are a multiple of 5 in a box, which we can cleverly label 5z, since every multiple of 5 is of the form 5 times k, where k is an integer. Or we can also label it 0 to remind us that if we divide any multiple of 5 by 5, the remainder is 0. Notice I'm using square brackets just to differentiate the box from the actual number 0. Similarly, we can put the integers that are not multiples of 5 because they have a remainder of 1 in their own box. Let's label it 1. Likewise, integers that are off by 2 go in their own box, 2. Integers that are off by 3 go into box 3, and integers that are off by 4 go into 4. The upshot is that integers essentially come in five flavors, those that are multiples of 5 and those that aren't, of which there are four varieties. Once we partition the integers in this way, the individual numbers themselves aren't so important anymore. What's more important is how they relate to the number 5 and its multiples. Really, we're identifying or packaging together the integers that share a common relationship, namely, the remainder you get after dividing by 5. In this sense, integers lying in the same box are equivalent. Let me explain equivalence a bit more. Look in the box 1, for example, where each integer has a remainder of 1 after division by 5. This is the same as saying that the difference between any integer and 1 is a multiple of 5. For example, negative 9 minus 1 is negative 10, and 6 minus 1 is 5, and so on. So let's lay down some terminology. Two integers relate to each other, written with this tilde, if their difference is a multiple of 5. So negative 9 relates to 1 because negative 9 minus 1 is negative 10, and 6 relates to 1 because 6 minus 1 is 5, and so on. So the box 1 is really just the set of all integers that relate to 1. Similarly, 2 is the set of all integers that relate to 2. 3 is the set of all integers that relate to 3, and so on. But this relation isn't just any relation. It satisfies three special properties, which you can check. It's reflexive, that is, every integer relates to itself. For example, 6 minus 6 is 0, which is divisible by 5. The relation is symmetric, for example, 6 relates to 1 and 1 relates to 6. And it's transitive. Example, negative 9 relates to 6 because negative 9 relates to 1 and 1 relates to 6. Because these three properties are satisfied, the relation is called an equivalence relation. And the set of all integers that relate to a given integer is called an equivalence class or congruence class. So what we were labeling as boxes are really equivalence classes. And what's neat is that we can do arithmetic with equivalence classes. For example, 
3 plus 4 is defined to be the equivalence class 2 because 7 has a remainder of 2 upon division by 5. And other operations in modular arithmetic, like multiplication and exponentiation, can be done on the equivalence classes themselves. Finally, the set of these five equivalence classes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, also has a name. It's a quotient set, which we label z slash 5z, pronounced z mod 5z. And this allusion to division is no coincidence. By organizing the integers according to their divisibility by 5, we are essentially dividing out the integers by all multiples of 5, 5z. But remember, 5z is really the equivalence class 0, so in that sense, we're dividing by 0. After all, in modular arithmetic, adding or subtracting by any multiple of 5 doesn't do anything. Multiples of 5 act like 0. For example, 1 plus 10 is 1. We can also see this visually. Here's a pinwheel with 5 blades. Its rotational symmetry is encoded by the elements of z mod 5z. 0 represents a rotation by 0 degrees, 1 is a rotation by 72 degrees, 2 is a rotation by twice that, or 144 degrees, and so on. Notice 5 corresponds to a full revolution, 360 degrees, which puts the pinwheel back in its original location. Since 0 and 5 transform the pinwheel in the same way, 5 and all of its multiples are the same as 0. So 1 plus 10 really is just 1. The pinwheel looks the same whether we rotate it by 72 degrees and then two full revolutions or just 72 degrees. And there's nothing special about the number 5. For any positive integer n, the quotient z mod nz encodes n-fold rotational symmetries. And the set nz, the multiples of n, behaves just like 0. Whether we rotate by 0 degrees or by one or more full revolutions, the effect is the same. By the way, this is the beginning of group theory, which we'll cover in an upcoming episode. So, how do you divide by 0? You write down an equivalence relation and form the quotient set. And the idea of quotienting extends far beyond the integers. Given any set x and any equivalence relation on that set, we can form a quotient set by identifying or clumping or gluing together all of the points that lie in the same equivalence class. In fact, x can be a group or a ring or a vector space or whatever, and we can form a quotient of that group or ring or vector space. This gets really cool when x is a topological space, like a disk or a square, because that's where this gluing analogy becomes like actual mathematical glue. And that's what Gabe will talk about in our next episode. Last time we talked about the metallic ratios, which are generalizations of the golden ratio. And I left you all with an open-ended challenge problem, namely, to figure out whether any of those metallic ratios is equal to the diagonal to side ratio in any regular polygon. And you guys had a lot of input. There was overwhelming feedback. A lot of you sent us individual emails showing your approaches to the problem. And this was echoed in the comments where people were actively posting the results of their numerical searches across lots of metallic ratios and lots of polygons. It was awesome. People were posting their, their code from GitHub that they used to search. I loved, I was super pumped to see like just the level of engagement that this produced in the audience. In fact, so many of you responded that I'm not gonna be able to address all of you individually, so please forgive me for that. But I will respond to a few individual comments that I think nicely summarize the state of progress so far toward the problem, which as far as I can tell, is still not solved. A lot of you, including Matthew Sylvester, pointed me to a 2007 paper by a Spanish mathematics teacher that I had overlooked before. In that paper, she lays out an argument for why the bronze ratio, sigma three, uh, never appears as any diagonal to side ratio in any regular polygon. Now, it looks like that argument can be generalized, as many of you came to understand on your own, that, and the generalization is basically, we're looking for, the problem will have a solution if you can find some metallic ratio sigma m, such that that metallic ratio is equal to sine of pi k over n, whole thing divided by sine of pi over n, where n is the number of sides in the polygon, and k is some integer from zero to n, indicating which diagonal you're on. So that's basically the nature of the problem. Either that thing has integer solutions or it doesn't. But as Franz Luggen pointed out, setting up that solution and actually proving that it has some whole number pair that actually satisfies it, or proving that it doesn't, 
is a hard thing to do. And so far, a lot of you have done computer searches that are pretty exhaustive, but that's not the same thing as having a complete proof one way or the other. And by the way, we've added a link to that paper in the description of the Beyond the Golden Ratio episode, the 2007 paper. So if you wanna check it out, you can find it there. Now, many of you pointed out that there may be some way to narrow the search space, so that we don't have to look across all polygons, and that may be. In particular, uh, Kikbaus, I think that's how you pronounce it, pointed out that it might only be constructible polygons that would support a metallic ratio for the diagonal to side. And that may be true, I'm not sure, and, but you can check it. And as it turns out, Geek37 on his or her uh, YouTube channel um, had actually done before some explicit straight edge compass constructions of all the metallic ratios. If you look below, you can see the link to that uh, video so you can see how the metallic ratios can be constructed explicitly. Some of you also pointed out possible generalizations of the problem. So for example, Mike Meyer asked, have we looked in three dimensions? Have we looked, I assume he means, in uh, at diagonal to, to edge length ratios in polyhedra? And I haven't, but that doesn't mean that you can't. You don't have to solve this problem first to try to go to 3D and generalize. For another nice generalization, Actuarium started looking at diagonal to diagonal ratios and not just diagonal to side ratios and regular polygons. And I haven't looked at those results to make sure, I haven't double checked them myself to see if they're right. But if they're right, they're very interesting. Apparently, apparently if it's right, there are a whole lot of polygons in which you can find diagonal to diagonal ratios that are either the golden ratio or the silver ratio, at least in a preliminary numerical search, but nothing beyond that. Now. Again, if that's true, that's kind of suggestive that there might not be a g another metallic ratio that shows up, which only intensifies my interest in wanting to find a proof that that equation that I mentioned earlier in the comments uh, doesn't have a solution. Some of you pointed out some fun facts about the metallic ratios that I hadn't mentioned. Uh, Roxor 128 correctly points out that A4 paper, actually all A series paper, uh, always has an aspect ratio equal to the silver ratio. Um, and that's part of what allows that paper to be you know, infinitely subdivided and always be getting just scaled down versions of each other. And Rob Spies, or Spice pointed out one of the coolest facts about the golden ratio that I didn't know, namely that the golden ratio is very close to the conversion factor numerically between kilometers and miles, which means you can use successive Fibonacci numbers to convert from miles to kilometers or vice versa. So for instance, three miles is approximately five kilometers. 21 miles is 34 kilometers. That's awesome. A lot of you noticed that that dude from space time is now doing infinite series. What up? Tommy White in particular asked, well, how is it that you came to be on this show? How I came to be on Infinite Series? And really it was just serendipity of circumstances. Right around the time that I was finishing my stint at the National Science Foundation, Kelsey realized that she was never gonna finish her PhD dissertation if she didn't stop doing the show. Now, Ty Denae was available and so was I, but neither of us could fit this entire show into our schedules, but PBS basically said, well, if you guys can split it, could you make it happen? And we said yes, and the rest is history. Finally, Jeremy Kuhn and a bunch of other people were saying something about my hoodie drawstrings being asymmetric in the first half of last episode. What are you talking about, bro?